Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. We're uh, going to have an exceptionally timely event, which was largely fortuitous, but uh, we appreciate your coming out on a nice Friday afternoon. Let me introduce our panelists very quickly. If I was to read their full bios, it would take up the entire session, so I'm going to give an abbreviated version. Thank you. Uh, to my right is John Carlin, the former Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division at Justice, and he currently chairs Morrison and Forster's Global Risk and Crisis Management Team. At NSD, he did lead the investigation on the Sony attack, and one thing we all know, which is the uh, indictment of the five PLA members for economic espionage. Prior to leading NSD, he was the chief of staff and senior counsel to the uh, FBI director, some guy named Mueller. I don't know. Tanya you know. was anonymous. <laughs> yes. Um, to his left is uh, right is Rick Leggett, who has four decades of intelligence experience in cybersecurity and cyber operations, including uh, 29 years with the National Security Agency, where he served as the deputy director until April of 2017. Um, he also led NTOC, the Threat Operations Center, and was the IC's first NIM, National Intelligence Manager for Cyber. So again, another deeply experienced individual. And finally, uh, Jim Miller, president of Adoptive Strategies. He's on the boards of the Atlanta Council. We let him in anyhow. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, and Endgame. Uh, he's a member of the Defense Science Board, and many of you may know he co-chaired the Task Force on Cyber Deterrence. Before that, he was the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and the Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. So I uh, couldn't have a better panel for talking about this topic, which is not to talk about what the Russians have done, I think we all know that pretty well by now, but to talk about what should be done back, right? And this is a new kind of conflict we're in. It's not the Russian tanks pouring through the Fulda Gap. Uh, it's a different kind of conflict, and we will need different kinds of responses. Um, I've asked each of our panelists if they could briefly, say for five minutes or so, give some opening remarks. Then we'll turn to questions, and I hope we have time for questions from the audience. So, John, why don't we start with you? Sure, and I, I might start with uh, the angle of what do you do about cyber-enabled activity? And how do you have a strategy to deter that type of activity in, in a world where the rules are not yet entirely clear as to what, uh, what a nation can get away with in that space? Over a period of years, and Jim talked through some of the cases, we had started to move towards a policy of showing that when it comes to cyber activity, including by nation states, along with organized criminal groups and other non-state actors, that you can figure out who did it. Um, so doing the attribution and putting the resources in to do the attribution. And really for a while in government, uh, I had started on the criminal side of the house doing computer hacking uh, cases. And for that period, was really kept separate from what was going on in the intelligence side of the house. When I went over to work for Director Mueller as counsel and chief of staff, the door opened and I saw what we had on the intelligence side of the house. And the fact is we've been good at the attribution for a while, much better than the public or our adversary nations uh, knew. So we started changing towards a strategy. Well, it's great that we know it, but it's causing real harm to real people now. And in that sense, it's not a traditional intelligence collection issue. And starting first in the area of economic espionage with the indictment of the five members of the People's Liberation Army, but then moving on to uh, calling out publicly North Korea's behavior uh, when they attacked Sony motion pictures because they didn't like the content of a movie to charges that were brought against Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps affiliated actors for their attacks on the financial sector of one, figure out who did it, and two, and this was newer, make it public. Don't keep it on the intelligence side of the house, even though that, that uh, has real costs in terms of losing um, sources and methods and perhaps provoking confrontation in, in the sphere because once you start making it public, which I think is vitally important, not just to send a message to a foreign country or adversary, but also because the victims are often the, in the private sector and they can't take the necessary steps to protect themselves unless they know what's occurring. And that requires being more public about what we're seeing. And linked to that, 
we need action. We need congressional action. We need new regulations in this space. We need public support for taking retaliatory steps that may cause temporary churn. And unless they see the urgency of the problem by making public what's actually occurring, I don't think we'll have that collective drive towards action. So one, figure out who did it. Two, make it public. And then the third is impose consequences. So I named three of the four major adversaries in, when it came to uh, seeing provocative behavior in cyberspace, Iran, North Korea, and China. And what we hadn't done prior to the election was take such an action when it came to Russian activity. And whatever the, and there were complicated debates at the time, but whatever the thoughts were in terms of not taking action prior to the election, it's clear after the fact that the result has been that uh, Russia believes that it was a success and that without taking additional action, they're going to continue provocation when it comes in cyber. And since then, we've seen continued Russian activity, not just in the United States, but in other countries around the world that's designed to undermine the integrity of elections. We've seen the completely irresponsible use of not Petya, which is administration has publicly named that caused hundreds of millions worth of damages to companies around the world, including around 300 million just to one, uh, to name one, when it comes to the case of FedEx, to, uh, uh, to more recent uh, activity. Plus, we have a long history now of uh, Russia shielding the top 10, essentially, cyber criminals who the estimate from CSIS, I think, put last year at $650 billion worth of loss to global commerce. So when you put that together on, on a global scale, they're and the uh, things like, as reported in the Washington Post, attacking the Olympics, uh, what greater symbol of uh, countries working together to show that you're not a member of the world order than attacking the Olympics through cyber-enabled means. So. We've moved, and you've seen a lot of those publicly outed, to figuring out who did it and making that public. We're not where we need to be when it comes to imposing sufficient costs to change the calculus that gets the behavior to change. This isn't about regime change, and it wasn't with any of the other three countries in this space. This is about the having costs proportionate enough to whatever the benefit of the adversary is seeing of this type of behavior to get the behavior to change. And if you don't change the behavior, then the policy isn't working, and you need to keep ratcheting up the cost. And I'll close with uh, uh, thoughts on how one can do that or avoid some of the problems that came to the election. One, one thing that's difficult leading up to a democratic election, speaking specifically about elections, is ensuring that there's confidence in the assessment as to what occurred. And in that sense, very much support a uh, bill proposed by Senator Rubio that would have a requirement that the professional members of the intelligence community report to Congress what they're finding is. So it's clear whether or not people believe that someone, an adversary, is attempting to meddle in the elections. Two, in advance, outline what the consequences are going to be. The bill does that as well. And in terms of ways one could ratchet up current pressure, I'll throw out a couple of uh, ideas. One would be, we have sanctioned. I think the actions that we saw this week building on the Mueller indictment and the model of using the criminal justice system to make public in great detail what's occurring to force public conversation and, and action led to sanctions. The sanctions were good, but not enough. They're not enough to cause uh, behavior. To ratchet up the cost, one, you could look at tying the oligarchs that are surrounding uh, Putin to their assets and then seizing their assets, particularly in uh, real estate. Um, that The legal authority exists to do that. So then uh, you do the investigative work to make the tie to those assets and seize them uh, and impose additional sanctions on companies that they uh, run often through shells. Number two, uh, similar to the strategy after Ukraine, would be macroeconomic sanctions focused on certain sectors like oil and gas. Uh, that would cause real economic uh, pain and in that sense deter this type of behavior. Three, to try to do these uh, multilaterally and also to look at, as was done post-election in the United States in December and then again against the San Francisco consulate early in the year and as we've seen our British allies do across the pond, is to 
take actions against the intelligence operatives simultaneously with our allies, say 10 or more countries simultaneously taking action to, uh, to PNG, declare persona non grata operatives uh, operating out of post in countries uh, throughout the world. I think those steps could be proportionate to what the damage has been and send a deterrent message. Thank you. Uh, Rick, please. Great, thanks. Um, first off, I'd like to start by agreeing with everything John said. I think that's exactly the right, uh, the right way to, to look at this. I'd like to concentrate on the, uh, the benefit versus the cost calculus, because right now the benefit is huge and the cost is basically nil to the Russians. And so if, when you look at that, when you want to change people's behavior to get them to modulate their behavior, you have to lower the benefit, increase the cost. And how do you do that? I think one is uh, in terms of the upcoming midterm elections, let's secure the election infrastructure as much as possible. There's, there are a couple of bills in the Senate, one of them by Senator uh, Klobuchar, um, that I think uh, uh, are applicable that talk about providing federal funding to the states so they can take action. You don't want to make this a federally managed activity that infringes on states' rights, but you do want to provide them with access to threat information, so clearing some of the state, uh, state officials in the way that DHS has started to do, um, uh, engaging with them through the, the um, mechanisms like the multi-state uh, information sharing and uh, uh, advisory council, and um, taking advantage of the information that the federal government has and making it available to, uh, to the states. And there's been some great work in the private sector on that too. The Center for Internet Security has, has produced a book for states. The Belfer Center at Harvard has produced a, a manual for states to use to help do that. So continuing down that path and putting some resources and some more attention behind it. So make it harder to do that is thing one. Thing two, make it harder um, for the, uh, the, what I call information operations to reach their target. The t what's the, what are the target of information operations? The brains of the decision makers. So in this case, the decision makers are the voters in the country. And so how do you, without infringing on free speech, which is the First Amendment, which is a hugely uh, important American value, how do you make uh, people aware of the providence of things that they see on social media uh, activities like Twitter or uh, Facebook or uh, things that are uh, promulgated through the, through the news cycles. Um, you know, the stories are emphasized or not emphasized in order to, to make a, a certain point. The intelligence community assessment that was published last December um, does a good job of, of laying some of that out in the, uh, in the unclassified version that was, that was published. The use of state media and the use of troll farms. And if you Google Hamilton 68, uh, there's a website that's run by the Alliance for Securing Democracy, and I'm full disclosure, I'm on the advisory council for that. Um, they track the uh, activities day by day of the Russian associated troll farms and look at the stories that they're emphasizing and the divisive sorts of things that they're looking to highlight in social media. So how do we get a better handle on that, make people aware, uh, help people think critically and look at multiple sources of information? That's a big, huge strategic problem. We won't fix it this year, but it ought to be something that we look at long term going forward. Third thing is, what are the things that would cause the Russian government and specifically President Putin to change the guidance that he's giving to his people? He cares about controlling information flow to the population of Russia. That's a core part of keeping, uh, keeping power, is making sure that, and keeping his high approval ratings, is making sure that the information flow is managed. Um, he also cares about support of the oligarchs. John mentioned one way to approach that. I think that's a, a, a good approach. He also cares about support of the military and support of the intelligence services. And so, and finally, he cares maybe less than those first four. He cares about the, uh, I'll call it a thin veneer of respectability on democratic processes that are go going on in Russia, especially with the upcoming election. So mm -hmm. there are things that the U.S. government could do if it chose to in each of those domains, and it would require some careful thought about which ones do you, uh, do you start with and how do you ratchet up. The sanctions that the uh, that the uh, Trump administration just uh, announced against Russia are a step, but they're a step on a long staircase. And so you want to think about how you go from step to step in that process until you reach that point where the benefit is decreased and the cost is increased to the point where it changes the behavior. Thanks, Rick. Jim. Good, thanks, Jim. I, I guess I'll start by agreeing with both, uh, both <laughs> John and Rick. Uh, and what I'd like to do first is a disclaimer, although I may re make reference to uh, some of the findings of the Defense Science Board report on cyber deterrence, which I did 
uh, co-chaired with Jim Gosler. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, not on behalf of the Department of Defense or anybody else. I thought I'd make uh, two quick points and then, and then add some additional steps the United States may take. And I think it's important to think of it in terms of a campaign plan uh, because, uh, as, I'll, as I'll point out, there are escalation risks uh, associated with taking actions, but there are greater escalation risks associated with not taking a strong action. So point one is that, uh, is, is that to have an effective deterrence strategy, you need to think about the mindset uh, uh, and values of the, of the, of the uh, party, uh, in this case an individual, President Putin, whom you're trying to deter. And to, to put it pretty, pretty directly and uh, succinctly, in President Putin's eyes, it appears that uh, his view is that the United States is the aggressor in this space. When Russian authors have written about hybrid warfare, they're talking about uh, U.S. and Western non-governmental organizations who have come promoting democracy. Uh, uh, and they've, thr they've thrown some of them out of Moscow, but it continues to be, in their, in their view, a campaign. They see the United States and Western Europe pursuing NATO expansion. Uh, we've done that since the end of the Cold War, and, we, and uh, uh, at this point in time, Georgia is still on the table, and Ukraine potentially is. The United States is pursuing conventional military superiority. It's part of the national defense strategy. In fact, it was explicit in the last administration as well as this administration. And somewhat surprisingly to me, the Russians also believe, and I believe President Putin believes, that the United States is pursuing nuclear superiority. When you look at this crazy uh, uh, so-called status six system, the nuclear powered nuclear torpedo in intended to, uh, with a multi-megaton cobalt-based warhead, take out the west coast of the United States, it shows a certain degree of, of paranoia, to say the least. So you can argue that P Putin is wrong on these issues, as I believe that he is. Uh, but at the end of the day, President Putin and the senior leadership believe that the United States and the West are pursuing regime change. That's, if you want to understand the stakes here and what uh, President Putin may be trying to pursue, you need to understand it at that level. The, the bottom line goal is to prevent us from having the ability uh, to grow NATO, to, to put pressure on them, and ultimately to impose regime change. Pretty high stake stuff, that's point one. Um, point two, we need to push back, and as we do so, there will be risks of escalation as the United States and other, others push back. But if we do not push back, there will be certainty of escalation. And the escalation initially will be, will be one-sided. It will be Russia continuing to increase the steps that it takes uh, in terms of its information operations, in terms of its uh, potentially affecting elections rather than just having some potential to do so, as it did in the last election. Uh, and obviously, uh, should it wish to do so, in, in terms of its turning the dial up on pain on the United States through cyber attacks on the electrical grid, on water supply, and on other critical infrastructure, and we just saw reports yesterday about uh, Russian capabilities in that area. So we, we now know as a matter of uh, a public record that Russia has cyber tools embedded in the U.S. electrical grid and in other areas and to include in our nuclear power plants, which shows an ability to scale this potentially to a pretty high level. So taking action will have risk of es escalation. If we don't take action, uh, we'll see one-sided escalation uh, and at some point, at some point, um, there's no doubt that either this president or a future president will decide to take more significant action, or Congress and the American people will press toward that. And if we haven't taken uh, uh, action in the meantime, if we wait until it reaches a, a catastrophic attack on the United States in the midst of a crisis, then President Putin is likely to be surprised by the action we takes and the, that, that we take and the risks of serious military escalation will be far higher. So if we wait to impose greater cost, somewhat paradoxically perhaps, we, want to, we run a much greater risk of, of escalation. I want to just list, just literally list one sentence each, 10 steps that we could take. Uh, first of all, to reiterate, much stronger sanctions that target Putin and his, and his uh, oligarchs or cronies. Second enlist international support for these sanctions. We've begun to do that, we need to do more. Uh, third, be prepared to back off of these sanctions that are focused on cyber and information operations if Putin's behavior changes so that they are conditional. That's an important part of having successful uh, deterrence and coercion. Third, we do need to develop real, not just uh, legal um, actions and not just sanctions, but uh, real cyber op options to go after Putin's valued assets through cyberspace so he doesn't think that he has escalation dominance. Uh, fifth, I completely agree we need to get off the dime on boosting 
uh, the defenses of our election system. We're behind the power curve for 2018. Uh, we need to be in a much better position for 2020. Six, we need to push back on information operations, and we can talk about how far we want to go there. The State Department's Global Engagement Center is effectively doing nothing but studying the problem at this point in time. Uh, uh, we can debate what it should be doing, but nothing doesn't seem like the right answer. It's been great to see that some of the big companies, including Facebook, Twitter, and Google, begin to step up. Uh, their role is going to be fundamental uh, in, in fighting fake news and, and so forth. Uh, and it does come to First Amendment issues pretty directly, but it's something that, uh, that the private sector will have a central role. Uh, seventh, the push on defense of critical infrastructure is fundamental. It's a long-term campaign. Uh, we're 10 years away at least from being able to protect the electrical grid, so that's not going to be a near-term solution. Eighth, we need to expand help to our allies and partners because um, today and as we improve, they will become more vulnerable uh, in relative terms, uh, and they will be a target, as we've seen from, uh, from Russia date. Ninth, we should not cut off high-level contacts with Russia. One of the, I would have liked to have seen Theresa May and the British government do more in terms of imposing costs, uh, but not to cut off high-level contacts. We need to have those discussions. We need to ensure that President Putin and his senior leadership understand why we are doing what we're doing, and because there is a significant likelihood of this escalating, uh, whether near term or long term or both. Uh, we need to have those channels. We need to have people who are, are able to understand each other uh, uh, in, in, in that context. And tenth, and related to that last point, we need to be prepared to strap it on here. Um, the U.S. is under attack. It's a different kind of attack than we've experienced before. It is going to escalate. It will either escalate because we don't do anything for a long period of time and the other side continues to escalate and then we will respond and that will be very difficult to manage or it will escalate more systematically and we'll have uh, an opportunity to have a bit of a, uh, a bit of a learning exercise on both sides. But it's, 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 it's virtually certain to escalate. Um, so far this administration has taken very modest steps, uh, far too little, far too late. Uh, I hope that they'll take more significant steps in literally in the coming days and weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I, that last point is one that struck me, and one of the reasons we're having this event is in discussions you have with, I'd say, intelligence or military professionals on an unclassified or, or classified basis, there's a general consensus within the community uh, that we are in a conflict, right, and that the conflict is getting better, not worse, and that we actually aren't doing so well. It's getting worse, not better. Uh, that's what I meant, I beg your pardon. Say. Getting better, uh, better for somebody else, but not for us. Uh, that's the wrong way to go. So that we are in a new kind of conflict, and if I got a general agreement from the speakers, it's that we need to do something back. And so maybe we could start our own discussion here by asking, what does that do something back look like? And one of the ideas that uh, some people, uh, including me, have floated is, we had a fairly effective campaign, we can talk about how you define effective, uh, against ISIS. It was Joint Task Force ARIES. Should we be taking, and Jim, you mentioned we need a cyber response. Mm -hmm. Should we be taking pages from the JTF ARIES book and applying them to our opponents in cyberspace, Russia, China, Iran, maybe North Korea? I'll go first if that's Only okay. go first and then we'll so go on the road. I, I think the Joint Task Force ARIES is a good model. It, it included uh, both cyber activity, technical cyber actions, as well as information operations. Uh, and the idea of having a campaign plan, a campaign approach, is, is uh, critical as well. But the, the range of tools that should be brought to bear with respect to Russia uh, and its uh, information operations, its cyber actions, and, its, and, its, and, and some of our allies' uh, uh, domestic politics uh, uh, pressure uh, as well being brought to bear. Uh, on, individual, uh, on individuals and parties. We need to have a much broader portfolio and it includes legal action, it includes economic sanctions uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and it includes working with our allies. But the campaign plan uh, that includes all of these elements to include pushing back on uh, both information operations and on uh, cyber uh, is it does make a lot of sense. Rick? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it does. Um, I, I think it's got to be, as Jim said, um, knit together with uh, legal and economic and uh, diplomatic activities. It can't just be just cyber. Um, some of that has to do with the fact that we live in a glass house when it comes to cyber. We're more vulnerable than Russia is, and so um, a tit, in a tit-for-tat battle, we lose uh, because of the uh, American people have more at risk than the Russian people do, and the Russian, or the American government has more risk than the Russian government does, and so. 
you think about the malware that we talked about that's on uh, critical infrastructure in the United States. Well, it's been there since 2012, starting with something called Havex, and then 2014, Black Energy Bot. So and it's been known you know, that it was Russian. Um, and so the question is, what's that about? Is that about having a capability to use if and when you want to? Is that about messaging, a deterrent value? And I think it's probably a combination of both, good military planning just in case, and uh, a little strategic messaging and a little strategic deterrence mixed in there. And so to counter that, you can't just go back and uh, do cyber activities. You have to do more than that. You have to engage the legal system. You have to find the enablers both in Russia and outside Russia that are enabling that sort of thing to happen and start figuring out how do you exert pressure on them. You build a, a, a coalition of, um, of like-minded countries in order to make make statements about, you know, these sorts of behaviors are not tolerated. Um, Congressman Mike Rogers and I uh, wrote an op-ed a few weeks ago on four things the government should do, and one of them, and arguably the most important one, is a U.S. statement that says this behavior is unacceptable and we're not going to tolerate it. As we're not going to get international agreement in the time frame we need before the elections, so the U.S. should just say that unilaterally and then use that as a basis to gather international support for that sort of thing over time. Now I'm in the position to be able to say I agree with everything uh, that, uh, that Jim and Rick said. I walked uh, through a little bit already in my opening remarks two areas I think that in terms of we, you don't need like for like on how to respond to this activity. You need to devise measures that impose enough pain to change the cost benefit analysis and that's where focus one on uh, two types at least of sanctions that we haven't done to the extent that we could both in terms of uh, what the law allows and our uh, ability to apply it uh, when it comes to both the assets, the companies, uh, and real estate of oligarchs and also the macroeconomic sanctions. And then uh, this, secondly, the idea that there are known operatives and almost all of our allies uh, that are operating out of post, and so far it's been tit for tat, each country as something provocative occurs uh, will respond, but if that was done in coordination with allies simultaneously, it would show that there's an increase to the cost in this behavior. And the behavior right now is not against the United States. We've, we've talked about the uh, United States, but it it's global, and that, that's the behavior that has to top, stop. Russia is becoming a rogue nation, and uh, I don't know, uh, you kind of guess at the strategic calculations that are causing it to be increasingly rogue around a, a variety of areas, but that decision tree is causing it to do things like attack international institutions like the Olympics, to use uh, looks like Russian-affiliated actors using chemical weapons on the soil of uh, a close ally, the harboring of cyber criminals committing billions and billions worth of damage to everyone uh, around the world, and the servers are known to be located, and rather than take them down, they're signing up many of these organized criminal groups as intelligence assets while giving a green light to their continued criminal uh, activity to the use of something like NotPetya, a destructive uh, virus that self-propagates, uh, pretends to be ransomware, but in ransomware, if you paid, you'd be able to get your computer system back, and then this one you couldn't. That's hitting everything from hospitals to companies. When you look at that uh, behavior, to Jim's key point, is it, it's actually it's, it's against their own interests. Um, along with ours to allow that to continue to escalate because eventually there's going to be a snapback and that increases the chance of both sides miscalculating and having a much worse situation than you have now, which is why, like you're hearing unanimity, that it's so urgent that we act immediately to stop that otherwise one-way ratchet of escalation that makes it much more likely that there's a conflict that causes much wider harm. You're going to hear uh, agreement among the three of my speakers and me throughout the thing. And that's one of the things I wanted to get out of this is when you talk to people who either are in the business or were in the business, there's a general sense of, we, of consensus. There's a general agreement. And so one of the things we'll try and do here is maybe tease out if there is some place we can fight about 
I haven't found it yet, uh, but it's also to help get the public message out there that we are going into a fight. We're in a fight and we now need to maybe put a little bit on our side. And a couple points came up that might be worth talking about. Um, one of them is one of the uh, advantages that some of our opponents have, and if we come up with uh, response strategies, they could be applied to China or to Iran, who are also very active, to the North Koreans who are currently on their best behavior, but that could, could always slip. Um, they know that we worry a lot about being consistent with both our own laws and with international law, and particularly with international humanitarian law. And so how much do we need to worry about proportionality in these responses? Do we need to think about proportionality? What is proportionality in, in these sorts of activities? So we want to follow the laws of armed conflict, and it turns out that makes it a complicated response. I don't know who wants to go first. Jim, well, we'll get always looking at you. <laughs> I, I would be pleased to go first, but we have a we have someone with legal training. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's the I would first just, uh, time they turn to the lawyer. Yeah, I would, if I can make a quick comment, so, so you don't yeah. feel badly about yeah. that, John. I, uh, from my perspective, proportionality does not mean either that the response is symmetric, cyber for cyber, mm -hmm. nor does it mean that it's at exactly the same scale. A proportional response that's intended to send a message that avoids a war could be substantially a larger response than something that was, that was tit for tat. I'll, I'll, that's, that's from a policy perspective. Over to, over to someone who understands that. Now the lawyers that. will tell us why that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that, uh, I think it is, uh, it is right and forget the, uh, the lawyers saying forget the law here. It's the right policy to try to devise something that's proportion that is in, in other words, is designed to fit the action that you're, uh, that you're responding to and wanna, want to discourage. Now, it so happens in this case that we have pretty good estimates, particularly if you take into account, again, the scale of damage caused by both, not PETJA, but also the, the continued harboring and flouting of international norms when it comes to cyber criminal activity. We talk often about this big amorphous land of organized criminal uh, activity that's occurring through cyber-enabled means, and rightly so. It's not, though, uh, amorphous. It's not occurring from every country around the world. The cooperation between like-minded countries who disagree in a lot of other areas, but cooperate when it comes to law enforcement, uh, when, it, when, it, when it's criminal behavior, actually narrows it down where a lot of the behavior right now that's affecting the entire world's uh, I say digital economy, but really e-commerce is commerce now, is emanating from Russia. That means, though, when you're talking about proportionate steps, the damage amount is uh, way up uh, in the billions and billions of dollars. It'd be an interesting report, actually, to follow up on the CSIS if you did an estimate. So let's say the last estimate is somewhere between $650 million to a trillion dollars worth of damage from criminal cyber behavior. How much of that can you assign a percentage that's coming, not necessarily from the Russian, uh, that you directly attribute to the Russian state, but is coming from Russia without response to requests for law enforcement cooperation? That gives you a sense of where the outer boundary might be on proportion. We, we've actually gotten exactly that question from uh, the House Finance Committee, so hopefully we can cook up an answer to it. But. I think it's probably going to be more than 50% as attributable to Russia. Uh, that's a guess, and we need to refine it. But Rick, when you think about proportionality, how much did that worry you in your old jobs? Well, I think uh, exactly uh, as uh, John points out, you know, it's a legal basis. We're a nation of laws. We follow those laws, and so of course we have to. Um, uh, we have to be proportional. But I also agree with what Jim said. Proportionality doesn't mean exactly equal and certainly not exactly in the same domain. Um, so what are the things, if you, if you look at the assault on our democratic institutions um, and our society and the use of inflammatory, um, you know, sometimes fake news, sometimes uh, emphasis of uh, or, or slants on a particular story that may have a kernel of truth, um, that is a big deal. That's a strategic attack on the United States. And so I think the bar is pretty high in terms of things that we can and should do in order to respond to that. I'm not advocating a military response. I don't think that's appropriate. I mean, a, a kinetic military response. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there are things short of that that are serious that we should consider. You could think of a, a, a sort of a scale where you'd have um, cyber, kinetic, 
uh, legal measures on one side, covert and overt. Is there a preference for how to do this? Does overt have an advantage over covert? What's the blend that would be most effective? Uh, can I take a swing at that? Sure. Uh, so yeah. I, think, I think that we, we want the hand of the United States to be seen in this place because we're sending a message, we're trying to deter behavior. And so if, if you don't um, let the hand be known at least tacitly, then, uh, then it leaves you in a weak place. And I have to say that the Russians uh, have done a masterful job of this, of, of doing these, uh, uh, taking these actions and doing things that are um, essentially uh, you know, illegal under international law, but having it be known but not provable uh, that it was the Russians, and sort of a wink nod. That's good. Um, from a deterrence point of view, it's also good for internal consumption and it shows the president as a strong man who stands up to the West. And the Russian view is that, you know, they're not a great power anymore because the West uh, victimized them in the Cold War. Jim or John, did you want to? Sure. I, I, I think you covered many of the categories, but it's worth being explicit to include diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it's limited to diplomacy, in other words, you know, um, uh, strong words and so forth, it's, gonna, it's clearly going to be inadequate. Uh, but in addition to uh, in addition to the categories you put out, and, and, and John can speak in more detail this, uh, and with more expertise, of course, is economic sanctions of various flavors, whether they're targeted uh, um, at specific individuals, whether they're targeted at other entities, at firms. Um, uh, they can be tailored. Uh, they're they're not a perfect tool, but they're a critically important tool in this area. And uh, and I do think that we we just need to say if we are getting hit with offensive cyber. Uh, penetrations, then the use of offensive cyber to counteract that should be on the table. To, uh, on the point of diplomacy being a, an important part of the package, I think that's, uh, that's right. And, and it's also proportionate to what's occurring because, again, it's not, it's an attack on democracy that we're seeing where there's a systematic attempt to undermine democratic regimes in countries throughout. Mm -hmm. Uh, the world. Their cyber criminal behavior is affecting countries indiscriminately throughout the world. The reckless use of offensive tools like NotPetya affecting countries throughout the world. And so the more countries that can be involved, the, more, the greater the likelihood you increase the cost in a way that changes the behavior before it reaches a state that, uh, that you don't want. And so related to that, I think public is important. And that includes uh, working on means Use of criminal indictments is one. Sharing information with private sector and with parties overseas is another. Of, of sharing resources and making attribution public and continuing to uh, continuing that strategy, which I think this administration is, pers is pursuing. Uh, speed matters, so trying to do that uh, quickly and in conjunction, conjunction with allies. I'll throw out one idea that I'm not sure I exactly endorse, but to try to be. Another uh, area to take a look at would be uh, and this is related really to this, the uh, cyber criminal activity. I don't think it fits as well for the undermining uh, an election regime, but the sovereign immunity doctrine to see if uh, uh, you might be able to do it now, but also to see if there are ways to look at statutes that would increase the likelihood that private parties could bring suit for the damages that they've suffered. And one. Uh, not Petya, the damages to certain companies are already out and outlined um, by independent groups. So there are victims here uh, suffering damages. You could consider such a mechanism as well for uh, election. I think it's harder to come up with a concrete damages and probably less suited to the civil, civil system. Now, that uh, approach has been explored before for uh, those who support state-sponsored terrorism and it has drawbacks as uh, drawbacks as well because it uh, which is why I think it'll be uh, that, that one's more provocative I'm not sure I'm endorsing it, but it's something to think about that Jim, was pretty bold yeah. <laughs> go yeah, ahead it's interesting Jim could I could I add a category yeah and, and, and actually I may ask a question of you because you're, you're deeply expert on this topic so improving the resilience uh, from a technical perspective of the critical infrastructure for example is, is vitally important. Our, our Defense Science Board uh, uh, report concluded that uh, we are not going to get there within the next 10 years with respect to Russia or China. But m taking those steps will make uh, increasing the resilience of critical infrastructure uh, and, the, and the cyber protection associated with it will make it more difficult for them, will make it attribution 
uh, uh, more viable, and it will make it uh, also, critically importantly, less likely that terrorists or other lesser state actors like North Korea and Iran are able to hold us at, at that kind of risk, a catastrophic attack. And the same is true on the information side, uh, that um, uh, the Russians are really piling on to, when, they're, when they're, they're piling on to fires that are already lit on the far right and the far left, um, they're pouring gasoline on them, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not creating new arguments and for the most part. They're, 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 they're amping up arguments that are there and trying to get us to be more polarized. Um, the reality is that uh, the, the phenomenon of fake news is not something that they brought here. It's something that exists, has existed over here and that they've, they've helped to develop further. So finding ways for, the, it's heavily in the private sector, but there's a government role as well, finding ways for us to combat fake news uh, in ways that are consistent with the First Amendment and, and so forth, I think are fundamentally important. You can think of that as a type of resilience. But I, I just want to put that out as a category. It's, I think it's absolutely essential. I do not think it is by any means sufficient, but it is absolutely essential, and it is even more essential for the lesser actors who have increasing cyber capabilities and who are going to want to get into this game of manipulating U.S. public opinion as well. No, I... Uh, I think you need to split it into two parts. And so on the resilient side, I'm a little gloomier in that I don't, 10 years is probably an optimistic estimate. So I do think, in, so I used to make fun of deterrence and I still do at some levels, but I think you have to convince potential attackers, and we have four, that the risk of doing something to US critical infrastructure mm -hmm. is outweighed by the cost. And that's part of what we're talking about today yeah. is how do we identify costs that could apply to people? The, on the social media side, I think there's this question of um, what does, inter, what does uh, intermediation look like? What does the, uh, the, the ability to um, impose new standards on the new media uh, look like? And mm -hmm. you know, some people have said, well, Facebook needs to go out and hire 3,000 editors. They, they probably don't need to do that, but how do we encourage people to begin to identify the false information. That's probably something you can do with technology. Mm -hmm. But how do we do it in a way that's respectful of freedom of speech? Mm -hmm. And so it's a very uh, intentionally complicated issue because no US government agency has the authority to go and say, this is, this is fake news, this is false. Mm -hmm. So it's something where we'll have to either change the laws or find incentives for the companies. I do think that there's a, a role for the government in terms of helping identify the provenance of a mm. story and helping to identify, you know, the first time this story appeared was in this place, uh, to our knowledge. Um, and so that's input to a process mm. that I agree the government can't run. Um, but I think that, uh, and John, you, you would be the expert on this, but I think that, you know, they could add a paragraph to the 39 paragraph end user license agreement that nobody needs that says, hey, we're going to exercise our judgment and, and we're going to flag, um, you know, things that we believe are suspicious or um, don't look factual and you agree to let us do that. How would you break, uh, how would you avoid a tit for tat cycle? What would you do to, we, this is not going to be a one move game, mm -hmm. right? So we've experienced things, I think we all agree we should do something back. And I'm fairly confident the other side will not say, okay, we give up. <laughs> so we're going to get into an iterative process here. How do we control that? And I don't know if escalation dominance is the right way to think about it. Mm. That's a nice nod to Herman Kahn. But what is it we do to get out of the cycle of just tit for tat? And you've seen this in certainly some mm. of the terrorist cases, certainly the Israeli experience. It doesn't do you any good to get into a response, counter-response cycle. How do we beat it? I, I agree with that. It, it's true within cyberspace it, because, um, as was noted earlier, we are more vulnerable than Russia in cyberspace. Uh, um, that does not necessarily need to be the case forever. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think 10 years is probably on the optimistic side for hardening, but it's not on the optimistic side for increasing our offensive capability. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is non, I'll say, non-trivial even, even today. Um, uh, the, 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 one of the challenges you just, we need to just have in the foremost of our mind as we think about uh, U.S.-Russia tit-for-tat is that the high end of the escalation ladder is thermonuclear war, right? right? And so um, uh, taking steps to show that we have limited aims, even though we're responding strongly, uh, keeping open uh, channels of communication, taking note of fire breaks, 
today there's a fire break, uh, certainly between conventional and nuclear. I believe there's a fire break between, if you will, non-kinetic and kinetic. At the point at which you cross one of those fire breaks, you're opening up a new, a, a new level of, 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 of uh, potential conflict, and it's, um, and, uh, and it's important to understand that. Uh, uh, and, and finally, there's also something uh, to momentum as well as to, uh, as to tit for tat. In other words, if the other side doesn't have a chance to absorb your actions uh, along with your explanation of the action and its limited aims as well as its intent, uh, then the possibility of moving uh, into a rapid tit for tat that could spiral, I think, is much more is much more dangerous. I think you also have to demonstrate that you're in this for the long haul. This isn't a two move game. This is a game until it's done, until we get to where we want to go, and that requires um, a um, a uniting of uh, messaging from the administration and from the Congress to, to say, and a support of the American people to say, yes, this is something that we think is important, and we're going to stay in until it's done. The support of the American people and ideally key allies, mm -hmm. um, uh, key allies as well. I think where we are is we're so far behind where the escalatory actions have taken us that the next step ideally should be coordinated and large, and mm -hmm. that will give the that will give a pause and time to uh, assess. The problem now is that it's coming late and small, and yeah. so in, in, in that sense, it invites a similarly small uh, retaliation. You're always behind where the initial provocation, where the initial provocation was. This was serious. Uh, undermining the, our elections was serious, and I know I'm a broken record on not Petcha, but it's amazing to me that that's been publicly uh, attributed and disclosed, but the action to date in response, this was a good beginning this week where we saw uh, sanctions for the first time has not been proportionate to, to, what, mm -hmm. to what occurred. So that ledger needs to be balanced, uh, I think, with the, next, with the next set of actions. If you were gonna look for a precedent uh, for this kind of action, at least for me, the one that occurs first would be the Reagan administration. That's how long ago this was where you saw concerted action against, at that point, Soviet espionage by the US, the UK, Canada, and some of our other major allies. So what do we need to do now with our allies? What's the, how do we work with our allies in this? UK is easy, they have an incentive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's at two levels, and John has really uh, spoken, uh, particularly, uh, I think, to both of them. Uh, at one level, it's the, it's the, it's the coordinated responses. Uh, and it's, it's working together so that we don't surprise them or, or cause them to think that we've gone off the deep end and are going to take uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, such escalatory actions that, that we then lose their support and, and, we, and we weaken the alliance, which, uh, frankly, to President Putin would be a win. So it's that, it's that level of communication and this coordinated action uh, and showing, uh, showing to President Putin and to others to whom we wish to deter that we uh, are, are capable uh, and will act together. Um, that doesn't mean lowest common denominator. I think it, at the end of the day, um, having a sufficient coalition uh, is very valuable, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to agree. And then secondly, um, uh, technical cooperation as well. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, that's been occurring over, the, over recent years. I think it could, that, that dial could be turned up dramatically. Uh, I know that there are, um, uh, in working with some of our uh, allies, uh, there are concerns about um, uh, it, uh, security of intelligence and security of technical information and so on. But the reality is to deal with the technical challenges and to deal with the vulnerabilities that we have in these systems, um, speed is going to be more important than information security in my view. And so um, getting the cycle uh, where we work with our allies and partners closely and, uh, and help facilitate the private sector supporting them even more than government to government, I think is gonna be, is gonna be fundamentally important. There's a, there's a, a number of um, Western-style democracies who've been subjected to this sort of stuff. Japan, in terms of the uh, of the Olympics, is one. I think uh, Germany, France, Norway, Netherlands, Sweden, all, uh, Italy, um, all of them have, in one way or another, been subject to uh, to this kind of activity. And so it seems like there there may be some natural allies in that space. And to you, uh, Jim, this is something you keep emphasizing in your questions. This is not just a uh, an issue of 
Russia. This is uh, an issue of, uh, at least in the uh, cyberspace, uh, I think, of sending a, a message to those other actors who are wondering wh what red lines are, what you can get away with, what are the norms when it comes to international behavior. And in that sense, too, it escalates the stakes of getting this right, or you're encouraging a miscalculation by, say, a North Korea or uh, an Iran or another actor when, uh, when times are tense. So the U.S. is encouraging uh, uh, response from like-minded nations to activities like this, and mm -hmm. response should be, you know, temporary, painful, but reversible, mm -hmm. right? And what you get back from some of the smaller NATO members is, um, uh, I'm worried about attribution. Uh, I'm worried that uh, I just won't take your word anymore that it was whoever you say it was, North Korea, China, Russia. Um, what do you do in those cases? And our answer, by the way, so far has been can't tell you sources and methods. Mm -hmm. Do you change that? Do you, do you just give up and act unilaterally? Or with, you know, some people have said coalition is willing. What's the right response? Go. Yeah, I, I think you have intel to intel service conversations about that. And, and we, we do exchange classified information with partner uh, um, services in, in other countries. And so, so and doesn't mean you show everything if it's a particularly sensitive uh, source, but you show a lot more than you would show publicly. And so, and then if the, hopefully the, uh, the um, government trusts their own intel people and they say, yeah, we looked inside the covers and it's real. Mm -hmm. Jim, I think, oh, John, go ahead. Go ahead. I, just, I think that as well you've seen um, a strategy. This, this occurred with the December ac uh, actions. There really were three. People focus more on the uh, shutting down of certain facilities and removing mm -hmm. operatives and sanctions. But the third was releasing the signatures of the, of the code that was being used by Russian actors. And similarly, it's been an open secret in the uh, cybersecurity community that the uh, energy uh, breaches were linked to Russia, but stating it publicly allows you then to show those indicators to allies who are looking at the same uh, trade craft. So there's a way to, in this space to work with the r robust third party communi uh, community of independent cybersecurity experts who, once they get the signature make make use of it. And, and John raises a really good point and one that I don't recall seeing in the, in, uh, the press. Those same um, implant and critical infrastructure exist uh, all over Western Europe and other, uh, again, friendly to the West uh, countries. So it's not just in the United States. If you were going to do one thing right now, I know we've talked about the need for a coherent strategy and an all of government approach, but okay, now you're on the spot. What would you do? What's the one thing you would do right now? Um, would you fry the servers in the Internet Research Agency? Would you, what would you do? Would you release Panama Papers too? Would you, tell me what you would do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a cheat. The first thing is to have a campaign plan approach to this, right? And, uh -huh. and to work with our, and once we've articulated where we think we should go, to work with our allies and partners so we're not acting alone. Um, second, I, I, I think it's time to go um, directly after uh, the so-called oligarchs uh, and to hit them in the pocketbook in a way that, that President Putin notices. And uh, that would be done through targeted economic sanctions. And uh, that would be, uh, I, I think it's useful to have a category of these of sanctions that are specific to the combination of cyber intrusions and, and ongoing information operations. Uh, and for example, we could say these would come off if we get through the 2016 election cycle and our allies do get through their election cycles as well without interference, uh, and they could, uh, they would go on. 2018. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, 20, yes, yeah. yes, thank you, 2018. Uh, and then uh, similar for 2020, but that we leave room for them to be dialed further up also if there's more interference. That would, that's not sufficient, uh, but I think that is a necessary part and it's one that I would be looking to build consensus on. Uh, right now. Just to push that one a little further, a key part of what you would do then is, is interact with the Russians and be fairly clear in messaging them about yes. what we're doing. Exactly. Okay. Rick. I, I think that's exactly right. And the campaign plan is, is a key part of that because 
uh, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any, any road will get you there, but we need to know where we're going and we need to have, uh, it doesn't need to be a fully formed plan, you know, in, in, on page 35, but the first five or 10 pages need to be clear and included in there is an overarching statement of the goal and something that you can use to generate um, unity and enthusiasm inside the country and with allies to support that thing. And then the first actual act I would take is exactly that, going after the oligarch's money in terms of asset seizure. Um, I would uh, use the, uh, the power of the U.S.-based financial system and the, the banks to exert influence on banks that, might not, that we might not have great relationships with, but they all send money through U.S. banks, and so that gives us a very big lever that we can use in that, in that case. We just need to be willing to use it. I've started in the same space, so I, uh, I uh, agree. Uh, the other thing I would consider, but this has less to do with the cyber activity and more to do with the incident that just occurred in the United Kingdom, is, is again, contemplate the simultaneous uh, expulsion of members at posts that are linked to their intelligence apparatus across multiple, uh, across multiple allies. The other thing, which I think is deterrent, although not in action, which is the pending legislation, would be a, a dead man switch. Uh, advocated for a while that says essentially if there's a neutral objective assessment from the intelligence community that's provided to Congress that says X country and it's country agnostic is uh, meddling with our election, the following uh, retaliatory actions will occur. And there's a version of that, I can't remember which bill, I think it may also be in the uh, Rubio bill that says essentially uh, when it comes to Russia, here are five banks, and the executive branch can pick two, any two of the five, but if this is the conclusion that there's meddling in 2018, then they will face macroeconomic sanctions, which cut, uh, would cut them off from the U.S. banking system. That way your, your red line is clear pre-election, and hopefully there's no confusion as to what our uh, action would be, and it takes it out of the partisanship so it doesn't exacerbate any tension between uh, any internal tensions here and that way achieve their goal because it's a dead man switch. It's going to happen uh, if the conclusion is reached. It's not a party decision. I would just, I would just say that it's with great reluctance that I endorse that idea. <laughs> uh, not just because of the, the, the history of the idea in the nuclear business where the Russians uh, reportedly uh, did have, uh, at least in the past, such a, such a mechanism to release their forces, but also because um, uh, I, would like, I would like a situation in which the administration and the Congress would work together and, and, and tailor something. That's been difficult lately, mm -hmm. and because of that, I would support that. I would just add that it should be the floor, not the ceiling. And that, and that should be understood because otherwise, you're allowing your potential adversary to calculate exactly what the costs are, and they can, uh, uh, and you, you want to add that uncertainty. You want to be able to add to that cost. So that, um, you can tell a couple of us are recovering arms controllers because we keep, <laughs> keep coming back to it, but it makes you wonder then what would a declar declaratory policy look like for this? Does a declaratory policy make sense? And maybe not in the old-fashioned way of a single sentence that says, if X happens, Y is the consequence. Mm -hmm. what, do we get a benefit from having a better declaratory policy? Do we even need one? Yes. Um, that was yes. easy? Yes, we need one, yeah. uh, and at the, at the center of it should be if we are attacked in cyberspace or in information space, we will respond. We will respond in a way that is intended to increase uh, the cost of that, of that attack uh, so that they uh, significantly exceed any benefits that the attacker could ex expect to achieve. And then fundamentally, importantly, we need, then need to act on it. Right. What mm -hmm. we've, I mean, uh, we have multiple statements that amount to a declaratory policy for many parts of the administration and for many members of Congress, and what we haven't done to date is take substantial actions that actually do increase the cost uh, that have any possibility to be uh, uh, even approaching the level of the benefits that are being achieved by these attacks. So maybe another conclusion before the Rick and John respond, maybe another conclusion from this conversation is um, we need to act. But, uh, yeah, I agree on the need for a declaratory policy, as I said earlier, and as we said in the op-ed. Um, and I think it uh, being overly specific is bad. You don't want to give uh, uh, them a roadmap on, okay, well, this is okay, so I can do this. And, and you want to just say, you know, if we see uh, activities that indicate, uh, as uh, Jim said, that that we're uh, being attacked, that our curriculum structure is being attacked, or that uh, efforts are underway to undermine our uh, 
our democratic processes, then we reserve the right to act with all elements of national power as we see fit in a proportional way. Words, lawyerly words to that effect. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't want to underestimate uh, that it's important to have a declaratory policy, but I, I would uh, firmly agree with Jim. We had one, we declared it, we've declared it now multiple times yeah. in the context of specific <laughs> actions and then not acted. And that that's, has a, the inverse effect of encouraging future future action. So I think less time right now on figuring out the exact words of a go forward declaratory policy and more uh, focus on putting points on the board and executing a response to the actions that have already taken place in violation of numerous statements from two administrations that really agreed on very little, very little else. If, if I was mean, I would now ask them, why do they think we haven't acted on this? But I'm not going to do that. Or I could ask them, how do we get out of the trap of making statements and not acting? I'll put that one on the table, but before I do those questions, uh, let me see if there's anyone in the audience who has a question now. Uh, we've got one, we've got two, three, four, five, six. We've got a lot of questions, so maybe we'll just go down the row and end up, go ahead. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, you mentioned the oligarchs several times, and I remember months ago I heard Paul Wolfowitz essentially float the same idea. He said, look, nothing's working. The way to get to Putin, get to those people he depends on to run a country for him, and attack them where they're going to feel it, in their lifestyle, their money. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like a clarification on that. Now, I'm not a fan of Russian oligarchs, but uh, the sort of principle here, you're not actually saying the oligarchs are involved in a cyber attack or anything. It's just Putin's dependent on them. If we, if we put a squeeze on them, they're going to say to him, hey, change your behavior because we don't like what's being done to us. Uh, but if you extended that principle, I mean, if you didn't like what Xi Jinping is doing, well, take, take the top 100 billionaires in China and put a squeeze on them, and then pretty soon he'll change his behavior. I mean, to, so could you clarify that uh, exactly what the reasoning here is? My guess is that we all have the same perspective on this, but let me, let me go first. Uh, I'm not talking about a, a blanket approach to everyone who's made a, made a, a, a ruble or, or billions of rubles in, in Russia or anyone who was affiliated with uh, President Putin anyway. Those people who are close and who are part of the decision-making process and specifically those people who are involved uh, and in, in a way in which we can credibly demonstrate, uh, even if it needs to be through classified channels to key callers, can we can credibly demonstrate that they have a role. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a role in decision making and uh, in support of some of these criminal networks that were mentioned earlier as well. Uh, there are a substantial number uh, to whom that would be applicable. And one thing I meant to raise and didn't because I forgot was that why China is in some ways a more difficult target than Russia because of the greater economic strength it has and the complicated uh, commercial relationship with the U.S., but why don't we do that? We can come back to, we have a couple of things we can come back to, but there are a lot of questions. Could you hold up your hand again? Uh, got, uh, ooh. And then we can just maybe slide over that way, and then we'll come back to this end. Thank you. I have two questions. So why do you say that we're more vulnerable in cyberspace than the Russians? That's number one. Yeah. And number two, if there's an unwillingness to act on everything you've said, what are our options? I mean, other than the hand wringing, but so far the administration has shown an unwillingness to do much, like even to acknowledge that Russia is a problem. Where do we go from there? So I'll take a stab at the first half of that, if that's okay. Um, the, re the reason that I said uh, the U.S. is more vulnerable than Russia is because we are so much more dependent on uh, computers and networks and information systems that underpin our day-to-day -day lives. Everything from uh, groceries showing up in the grocery store and gas showing up in gas stations on time to the network that supports using your debit card to pay for those things when it's time to do them to the power that goes to your house. All those things are, are intertwined and they're all part of... Uh, of a critical infrastructure. There's a, there's a great report by the National Infrastructure Advisory Council from August of 2016. It's on the DHS website that talks about the intertwined um, financial, telecommunications, and electrical power critical infrastructure and how if any one of those goes down, everything goes down. 
Although the good news is that I think we're approaching parity in terms of reliance on the internet, and maybe not all of Russia, but certainly mm -hmm. key parts in Leningrad, uh, pardon me, in St. Petersburg. Moscow. Oops, yeah. Moscow. Yeah. Uh, why don't we hold your hands up again, and this time, Pat, well, every time I say that, more people hold up their hands. <laughs> um, just pass the microphone along as we go, and that will save a little time. But we've got uh, the individual there with the blue shirt. Thanks. Uh, Mike Connell, CNA, Center for Naval Analyses. I have a quick question. In the past, Russia's broached the idea of internet sovereignty as perhaps a way of moving forward. That is, sovereign control of information flow within their territory. Is there any opportunity for working with them in that area, or is it just really there's no room for compromise in that, in that area? Hmm. Any of you guys want to? Well, uh, so the, the idea has occurred you could make a trade uh, where you acknowledged um, the desire by Russia and several other countries for greater control over the internet in exchange for some level of cooperation, perhaps on cybercrime, perhaps on stability. And it, it just, it, it, there's, there's two fundamental problems. The first is that very often uh, the deal would involve um, abandoning core parts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and Western countries aren't willing to do that. The second part is there's a concern that you could make the concession and then not actually get uh, anything in response. So. It has been talked about in the last few years and um, doesn't seem to be a, a useful avenue. Even the Russians don't raise it anymore. Uh, we had another one. Uh, go ahead. Paul Schwartz, also at CNA. Uh, I think Mr. Miller mentioned early on that uh, Putin perceives himself under attack and that the West is aiming for regime change. And it was uh, when it came time to talk about potential options, uh, going after the oligarchs was mentioned several times. Are these two things reconcilable, or, or, or are we risking uh, unwanted escalation by threatening the very thing that you said that he feels is fundamentally at risk here? Just basically. Yeah, in, in, in my view, there's, um, uh, it's important to go after uh, those people who are uh, involved in this, in this type of activity or supporting that, this activity. Uh, either officially or unofficially, and who are tied to uh, President Putin, uh, and at the same time to show that we have limited aims, to, to both state that we have limited aims, uh, and by the actions we take, not, not, uh, 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 not demonstrate that we have unlimited or, or broader aims of, of regime change or of undermining uh, uh, the power structure within the Kremlin or the power structure within the, in the country. Um, uh, anything that began to hit at that would be at a very high level of escalation. And uh, it, there's a precedent, um, you know, so, uh, with China, where there was the indictment of five members for the, of the People's Liberation Army, but it was very specifically tied and public messaging surrounded and made clear that this was because of a particular type of activity, the targeting of private enterprise here for the commercial benefit of co private competitors overseas. And subsequent actions uh, matched that principle. It allowed for a breakthrough where uh, President Xi agreed to that principle. And since then, you've seen a decrease in that type of activity. Not all activity, uh, but the type that, that uh, was within that uh, principle. And then you saw on the, uh, on the US side, there, weren't, there haven't been additional actions that are outside of that. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of that principle, so clear, me clear messaging and sticking with your lane, I think, matters. And if we have time, which looks like we won't, maybe we can come back to how would you persuade the Russians that we weren't kidding, you know, that we really were serious, that we weren't going to change the regime? Because I think they're deeply paranoid about that. Sure. But we had one more question, or we had multiple more questions. Uh, yes, gentlemen, thank you. Um, I think if you took a comprehensive look at our like policy on sanctions for Russians, it's going after the oligarchs is gonna be what hurts Putin the most, right? Um, we've sanctioned oligarchs, we've sanctioned banks and companies all over the world. Um, my view on that is that um, I think that what Putin values most is being the puppet master. He likes controlling the intelligence services, he likes controlling illicit activity, whether it be through um, federal agencies or 
you know, his army of um, hackers or mercenaries in different countries. What approach could we take to attack him if that's what we think hurts him the most? Uh, being the puppet master, being the, uh, the KGB officer that he formerly was. You can, you can just pass it to your right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick first response. Um, your question highlights why it's important to have a campaign plan and to think through the, the steps that may be taken today and could be taken in the future. My own judgment is that if, uh, if you lead off by going directly after the instruments of, of state control and the center of President Putin's or anyone else's power, that's a pretty big move. Uh, far more serious than going after some of the assets associated with some oligarchs or, uh, or other sanctions. And uh, I personally would think that you'd want to reserve that type of move for, uh, for higher on an escalation ladder, uh, understanding that you could get there, but that when we get there, uh, 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 President Putin may believe what's good for the goose is good for the gander, if you will, and there are steps that, that could be uh, taken on the other way around that could lead to, uh, in my view, potentially serious escalation. I wouldn't take that step off the table, but I would say that uh, it, if, if you believe that they're already worried about regime change, which I do believe, uh, to go after the instruments of power would reinforce that view and cause them to believe that they had to escalate in order uh, to be successful. Um, uh, the capability to do that may be something that we desire to prevent them from escalating uh, rather than something we would lead with, in my view. Yeah, I, if I can just uh, chime in, I would uh, agree with that, except I would add one more thing to the, in addition to the oligarchs, I would also demonstrate the ability, although not do it at scale, to get information into Russian citizens' information flow. There's mm -hmm. dozens of technical ways to do that, um, everything from you know, broadcasting uh, television over satellite into the country to, um, to uh, uh, doing things on the internet. And so I would demonstrate that, and I'd also signal that we can do this if we want to, and so it's, you know, we're, and we're holding back because we're, again, trying not to be escalatory, but we want to demonstrate the capability. Ed Gibson, a retired FBI agent and former chief cybersecurity advisor for Microsoft in the UK. Let me set the stage here, and Rick, this question is for you. If we rightly assume that Russia has something that they're holding over Trump's head. Is it possible, and I'm going to ask if your answer could be yes, no, or maybe, is it possible that Trump is taking actions, that the actions that Trump is taking to destroy our relationships with our allies and other countries with the intention, with the intention of making us act singularly such that our allies will not support us in the future, is that possible? Yes, no, or maybe. So is it possible or is it likely? Likely. And there's okay. a fourth option, which is if you've ever seen Sesame Street, the option is me no recall. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's highly unlikely. I think if you look at uh, <laughs> President Trump's behavior over his career and how he interacts with other entities, that there's a consistency there. It's not like a 90 degree or 180 degree change in behavior. So I think that this is just the extrapolation of that behavior into his new role. We had one in the back, and then we could maybe move over to this side. There's a couple, there's three. We're coming close at that time. Do you believe that this has set a precedent? Oops, <laughs> sorry. Do you believe that this has set a precedent for other nations to engage in this behavior and to interfere in other Western democracies? And if that is the case, maybe what countries could we consider as potential threats? I'll, so I'll, I'll take a quick cut. I, I, I think I think each of the other panelists may have more expertise on that, certainly on the on the technical side. Um, I think that we were very slow to respond. Uh, to Chinese theft of intellectual property. They did it at scale, uh, uh, at massive scale. Uh, and it was, uh, had economic cost to the United States 
uh, and economic benefits to them that I think are measured at least in the hundreds of billions, if not if not trillions. So that was uh, we were late we were late to take action. I'm pleased and proud that President Obama did so, and that and I'm pleased and and I was frankly a little bit surprised at how successful it appears to have been in reducing the, the scope and scale of what the Chinese were doing. I think uh, your question. Uh, your question is is right uh, or, uh, is along the correct lines. If you are a, a lesser developed country and you're looking to bootstrap your economy, trying to find niches or even even larger areas where you can uh, gain intellectual property and have a second mover advantage where you didn't invest in the research and development but you can exploit it, would look awfully attractive and a small investment could could bring that along. The good news is that in putting pressure on those countries. The United States has a lot of tools, including uh, not just legal and, and diplomatic, but economic uh, pressure as well for smaller countries. Uh, and, and it's worthy of uh, considering what a campaign would look like in that regard. I don't, um, I, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. I, I was not aware of any, any uh, uh, countries, any small countries attempting to do that, uh, uh, attempting to do that at scale in a ways that uh, having that diplomatic conversation and, and the threat of economic reaction would, would not be sufficient, but it's something to it's something to consider for the future, certainly. Yeah, I, I agree with what uh, what Jim said. I misinterpreted your question. I thought you were asking, will other countries take a cue from the Russians and try to pull the levers to affect, uh, you know, elections and, and uh, opinions inside the United States? I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Um, and I also think that uh, it's not just governments that are doing it. There, uh, a colleague of mine was in Europe recently and told about a contact from a company that was offering information operations in support of a brand and a not very thinly veiled offer to uh, not just speak positively about his brand, but speak negatively about other people's brands. So think of it as combat advertising. Yeah, we, uh, uh, some of us got a briefing on um, effective uh, social media presence by uh, political operatives. and. My immediate thought was we should do it at CSIS to boost our ratings. But <laughs> can we move the microphone over to this to this side to get those? Questions? I actually have one question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. Um, and it's actually about social media. Uh, earlier, there was a comment about just giving Facebook 3,000 editors to mm. clear up that content, but that goes against the main point of Facebook. Facebook uh, considers itself more as a conduit, a platform mm -hmm. um, for articles. So, what does this look like? when the US government is asking things like um, Twitter and Facebook to help combat um, the fake news? We'll answer just in terms of waves. So uh, some of you may remember MySpace, which was one of the original social media sharing type companies. And the first wave, I think, is they at first did not take seriously the fact that child predators were exploiting that uh, platform to reach uh, kids. And that, uh, to some, uh, have said the fact that the platform no longer felt safe drove MySpace out of business and is where Facebook originally got its, uh, its rise. And then we saw during uh, the time that I was working on terrorism uh, issues, the Islamic State and the Levant adopt a new strategy of crowdsourcing terrorism and attempting to use social media just like Al Qaeda had used Western technology in the form of aviation to, uh, to kill, that they were trying to use social media to turn particularly young or troubled uh, people into human weapons to kill. And it took a little while um, in terms of conversation to convince um, those in social media companies this was a real issue, threat, and abuse. And when they were convinced, and that I think is a combination of private conversations and public attention to the issue, they took serious steps to, uh, to combat it and put additional resources in. And we're just at the beginning now of really focusing on the nation state uh, threat and the use of those platforms to do things like attack fundamental values of undermining democracy. In the interim, the other issue that they've been having is bullying. Um, which has de decreased the, uh, people's desire to use the platform and is a way of preventing free speech if you are so bullied when you uh, articulate an opinion that, uh, that you leave the platform. So I think there, there are deep business reasons consistent with their model why they want to make it ultimately a safe place. I think it was Rick who raised this area where there's, there's some transparency as well. So you're not deprived of access to the view, but you know where it's where it's coming from. 
And that should be encouraged and on the government part requires sharing as much information as they can about what the threat looks like in a way that the companies can consider and then take appropriate action using their platforms. It's worth noting too that uh, it's not just the US, it's also a number of countries in Western Europe driven more by uh, Islamic uh, terrorism than by Russia in many cases, so, or now by political extremism. So it may not just be the US uh, that asks these companies to change what they do. Um, can we move to this side? I think we, we, we've got time for the, I think we got two questions here, is that right? Hi, first, uh, thank you very much for coming today. Really appreciate uh, hearing from each of you. Uh, my name's John, I'm an Air Force officer and have a quick question about information operations. And so as it pertains to, I know you'd mentioned the GEC earlier today, um, would be interested in you, the way that you had portrayed it is that it was not very effective in your opinion. Um, what would it need to be effective? And is the State Department the right place for it? And then just kind of writ large, uh, your thoughts on information operations um, and how to do them effectively uh, and the authorities, legalities maybe that are needed uh, and what we can do to actually make them work. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, in, in terms of effective information operations, there certainly are areas in which the U.S. military does it effectively at the tactical level. Uh, and you can, you can go through multiple cases, including in, 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 in certain points of time and in many locations in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, during those operations. Um, that's obviously not what we're talking about here. Um, what we're talking about is uh, effectively communicating uh, uh, to e external audiences, including international audiences, uh, uh, regarding uh, on the one part of it, the, the GEX mission, uh, ISIL and, and, and Al Qaeda and so forth, and, and the new part about Russia. And to me, what that fundamentally means, and what is the what is the the centerpiece of effective informa information operations at the tactical level at all, is truth telling. And and the reality is that the United States is not going to be the most credible source of information about Islam or, uh, uh, or, about, uh, or about Russia. And so that means, to me, it means building coalitions uh, and, and emphasizing that, that the, the, the mission is to get the, the true story out uh, and, to, and, to, and to shed light, literally, you know, literally um, uh, uh, in some instances, on, the, on what's really going on. And uh, I think uh, any effort uh, to in anything that has the slightest uh, taint of propaganda will be absolutely counterproductive. And uh, whether in the counterterrorism or in the in the combating the propaganda from Russia role, it's got to be about truth telling and getting and getting this and getting the story out, and working with others who will be more credible than our State Department uh, in that regard. I agree. I, I think the, the model, in my mind, is like a combined joint task force where you've got uh, from all across the whole of government and you've got international partners and they work together under some kind of a command and control construct to say, here's our, agree on the goal and agree on the campaign plan and then execute it in that way. And um, I'm a former DOD guy myself. I would not put DOD in charge because internationally that resonates in a certain uh, negative way. But I def DOD would definitely be part of the team. Peter Neumann, who's at uh, King's College of London, had a good idea a year or two ago, which I don't know if he published, but it, this is in a conversation that, you know, we should just, we the USG should just get out of the business because people aren't going to trust us and, mm -hmm. you know, we're too old and the whole bit. And he said, why don't you just create contests on YouTube and have like a $10,000 prize for the best, we're talking anti-terrorism, uh, right, anti-terrorist right. video. Let, let some kid do a rap video on, uh, you know, or hip hop on, on it, and it'll be, it'll be 10 times better than, mm. we used to call them useless when I was a child, but the State Department entities responsible for this. Um, I think we have time for one more question, is that right? Yeah, while we're waiting, Jim, that kind of reminds me of the, I think they called it the Madison Valleywood uh, Coalition that the previous administration put together to get Madison Avenue, Silicon Valley, and yeah. Hollywood together to try to produce counterterrorism messaging. And that that they, with they arrived right where you did, which is, I think they sponsored, called tackathons oh, yeah. of developing yeah. content in, in, in universities, and the government just explained the terrorism problem and then stepped back and said, we'd be the world's worst messenger to disaffect <laughs> right. the youth. Mm -hmm. You do. Mm -hmm. do so that's another area doing. of consensus is, I think everyone up here thinks that USG should get out of the business when it comes to. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. 
uh, Rob Shaw, USG, um, <laughs> Homeland Security. Um, I think my question dovetails nicely with the last two in um, talking about the information influence space and building resilience. And maybe this question is to you, Mr. Carlin, specifically. What viability do you see in a German-style law or approach that says uh, social media companies should have a reporting mechanisms by their users for this kind of information and maybe a reporting mechanism to the USG on how they handle that. Do you see that as something that could work here or would that run afoul of 1A or? So the, the first part of social media companies having a mechanism so that users could report um, content that's in violation of terms of service, uh, essentially, and having an effective mechanism. I think you're seeing movement towards that by our, by our social uh, media companies already. The question of then whether that required reporting to government, that would be a much more difficult and maybe not desirable to, uh, to mandate. There's huge um, brand incentive, though, uh, depending on the type of activity, but if it's criminal or other type of activity, to do those reports or do them in in scale ultimately, and then, as as I think Jim was touching on, we're in a we're in a world of multinational uh, corporations where they they need to operate and abide by the values of multiple countries and legal systems simultaneously. So, the actions of uh, countries in in Europe are going to affect. Sometimes they can be confined to the country. Um, thinking of the case of France, where certain content, if you had the same law here, it'd be violative of the First Amendment, but there you can work out a mechanism where it doesn't hit what looks like it's a, a, a French IP address. But by and large, I think this, the solutions need to be ones that can sustain a global test. So the value that it's endorsing has to be one that is consistent with countries that share our values and ones that do not on, on human rights, so that it's, it's a neutral value. And then secondly, the, uh, the execution is one that they could abide by in multiple countries without being violent of law. That's, and that's an easier, if you violate terms of service, uh, then that is an easier one to come up with a reporting mechanism and do, do that's, that's country agnostic. Anyone else? Nope. Well, let me uh, try and summarize a little bit, and if I miss anything, please correct me. But So what I got from this was we're in a conflict. It's not the kind of conflict we expected, but it's the one we're in. Um, we need to act, right, that another declaratory policy or de marshmallow will not do us any good. Um, we need a campaign plan, and it's got to be a whole of government campaign plan. It can't just be uh, a one-off type of thing. Um, we need a portfolio of responses that includes legal, diplomatic, economic, and potentially military, you know, either overt or covert. And when I say military, uh, it, it could be the intelligence community, it could be DOD, Cyber Command, but forceful responses have to be part of this. Um, this game will be more than one move. It will be multiple moves, and we need to think ahead of how, uh, how we will deal with those moves. Mm -hmm. And finally, messaging is important both to the American public, to the political leaders so they know what we're up to, um, but also to the rest of the world and to the Russian people. And that includes contact with the Russian leadership to let them know we have limited goals, uh, we're interested in stability, uh, regime change is not the target here. Did I miss anything? Anything summary. you want to add? Yeah. The only thing I, I might add is uh, part of that uh, preparatory work is getting everybody on the same sheet of music so that we're, if not completely unified, at least uh, may, uh, most of the um, compass arrows pointing in the same direction. Yeah, and I left out there. sustainability. Thinking about how to work with allies, making this a, yeah. more than a unilateral approach. So that's a good point. Two quick additional points, uh, and they, they, they uh, dovetail well with yours, Jim. Uh, one is that we need to expect es escalation, and if we don't respond for a long period of time, we'll have a, a rapid yeah. uh, later escalation, uh, and we're better off having substantial steps, and, but, it, but we need to understand that that will happen. Uh, uh, and your point about uh, limited aims uh, uh, speaks to that. And second, that increasing the resilience of the critical infrastructure uh, uh, and, inc and of including our electoral system 
uh, or, or 50 plus electoral systems uh, and the technology behind them and um, to find ways to, to reduce the impact and the salience of fake news uh, are important not just because of Russia but because these dynamics exist within our country mm -hmm. uh, and other actors including terrorist groups in small states that may wish us ill like at North Korea uh, will want to exploit them and their capabilities are coming up so we, we, we can't overlook that defensive side as well. John, any final? I, I'll echo on the, def the defensive side. I think we need to start thinking moonshot um, and incentivizing the research that says we're, we've put certain systems using, uh, we've moved information over a very short period of time, historically, 25 year period from analog to digital. We then connected it through a protocol that was never designed for security and we're on the verge of doing that on an exponential scale while repeating the same mistake of not building security in on the front end when it comes to the internet of things. And before we make that societal transformation, which would be the now, we need either uh, legislation, regulation, collect collective will to ensure we don't make that, uh, that move. And so that's another area where time to act is now, and that really is regardless of who the adversary might be, the genes that might exploit it. I IoT and 5G both. Yeah. 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 Well, you come to CSIS to get good news, so I think <laughs> we've, uh, but on the bright side, the, the discussion today has sketched out a path forward and maybe a path out of the hole we're in. So I'm pretty happy with where we came out today, and I, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.